My name is Chinadu, and you're welcome to Max. Boom. <laughs> that will stay in the video. It will, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so we're here with Chinadu today from the co-founder of Max and G. Correct. Right. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you. Thank Pleasure you. meeting you. Same here. What does Max and G do for the people that don't know you yet? All right, so Max is, uh, we're building out the technology and finance infrastructure mm -hmm. for mobility in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing this essentially, we do this to be able to make motorcycle taxis safe, affordable, and accessible across Africa. Okay. Today we're in Lagos, Nigeria, and Akure, Nigeria. Um, by the end of, by this time next year, we're expecting to be in a lot more cities. So be on the lookout, we could be coming to your city. So how did you come up with this idea? It's, it's a long time coming. So we started out doing um, logistics and delivery mm -hmm. for e-commerce businesses, right? Okay. And then, you know, with the economy struggling a bit here and there, and our business needing a lot more, we realized very quickly that we were using motorcycles to move about. Yeah. And wondered if this was a service that other businesses would be interested in. Um, with time, we realized very quickly that other businesses were interested in this and people were interested in this, but there was a problem, right? You couldn't really, you know, have consistent pricing, you couldn't figure out, you couldn't figure out safety. So we ended up looking at a system, building out a system that solved the issues around safety, affordability, access and pricing, right? Okay. And then tested out deployed in the market and people loved it. So we've been at it ever since then. We're a four-year-old company, but have done motorcycle taxis for the past two and a half years now. Okay, so you started with logistics, basically Correct. last mile delivery? Last mile delivery, yeah. So working with large e-commerce companies, okay. right? Okay. And helping them just deliver packages. Okay. Um, and then moved from that, while we were doing that, we added restaurants to the mix. Mm -hmm. did, did food delivery? Food delivery. Not just food delivery, but working with restaurants. So like a restaurant marketplace where people could go and order food from a restaurant okay. and would deliver. Okay. We failed at that terribly, right? We, we, we were too early to be doing that. Okay. We didn't have enough of a fleet. There was a lot of stuff we didn't know operationally that made it, that would make sense for us to do that. Mm -hmm. So we filled that terribly, um, shut that down, and then tended to add transportation to the delivery, mainly because as a business, we we're already doing a lot of transportation internally yeah. for ourselves and for our staff. Okay. And then did that market research and figure that it made sense for other people as well, because we wondered if it would make sense. Okay. So once we realized it made sense for other people as well, we went ahead and deployed it, and okay. it's we've we've not looked back, back since then. So today we do both logistics and transport. All right. Yeah. So right now I, I saw you you have an app. Correct. So that means if I'm someone that wants to get from A to B in Lagos or Victoria yeah. Island. I order a motorcycle taxi. Correct. And then someone picks me up, exactly. just like with Uber or what used to be Taxify. Exactly. And then I get somewhere. Exactly. What, what's the, you mentioned safety uh, several times. What is the what existed before? Were there any motorcycle taxis in Lagos before you? Oh, absolutely. Were? So in Lagos, there were there's six hundred thousand motorcycle taxis. Wow. That's a lot of people dying. All right. Um, we've never had a fatality in our system, so it's critical for us that if we did this, we did it properly. So we built out something called safety scores that allows in real time to check how safe drivers are, you know, how they are driving, figure out who which drivers are as risk drivers, and pull them off the road if need be. Wow. Right. So we, we we've done that. Right. We also have a lot of we have invested heavily in driver training, driver testing, regulation, all sorts of different things to make sure that the process of bringing drivers on board on our platform was smooth and consistent, and that we're bringing in the best quality drivers in the market. So, and then we have a continuous ongoing training and retraining program and a licensing program that we run in house. So, a lot of, that, a lot of our business is focused on making sure our platform is safe for our drivers and for our customers. Wow, I love that. Because, yeah. you know, I remember a few times that I've taken motorcycle taxis in Brazil, uh, in Ghana, uh, and I have to, to be honest, sometimes I didn't feel very safe with oh, these guys. You I, know? I, I, I get that. I completely get that. A lot of them are not safe. So how do you how do you figure out if a driver is uh, driving safely or not? We have uh, the driver application that we actually use to record. So we, we combine the gyroscope and accelerometer to record what is happening in real time on the bike. Depending on how those um, devices respond, we know how fast the driver is moving, how quickly he's accelerating, how quickly he's decelerating, how he's banking, how he's turning, if he's playing with his phone. All those things we can tell all that all right. and then that data goes into a system where we then crunch numbers and come up with what we call the safety score wow yeah it's i mean you know if, if one just sees the app or something one might not know what is actually behind exactly. it and what kind of social impact it actually is because safe driving is an issue in 
Absolutely. It's one of the leading killers of, of um, people in this part of the world. Like yeah. in East Africa, I think there's a company called Safe Motors, I think in Rwanda or Uganda, who is also doing something similar as far as safety is concerned. And in that market, road accidents are the, I think, largest killer after malaria or something like that. Wow. Right? And those numbers are similar in other markets across, across Sub-Saharan Africa. Wow. Did you ever think about licensing that techno the technology part to other companies that also have drivers? Uh, because, you know, if I have... We were traveling from Morocco to Nigeria now, uh, and I've seen so many trucks that have fallen over or something like this, that I'm just road safety in general is a big issue. And now you're tackling this very specifically with passenger transport here yeah. on a motorbike. But do you think this could also be useful for, for other... I absolutely think it can, especially when you think about... So, so the thing very useful, especially you talk about trucking, especially in that space and across the world, is very useful. I think that the challenge with a lot of different businesses and opportunities is, you know, are they able to make that investment, or is it is it is, do they have enough of a reason to make that investment? Because it's one thing to know that safety is important; it's another thing to believe that having real time reporting on safety is more important than just important, right? Um, so, I mean, a couple of ways that you can get people to you know use this is make it a requirement for the insurance company. So if I insure you as a driver or I insure your vehicle, I have to have a way of tracking in real time how safe you are, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so insurance companies can take this up and you know, enforce it. Yeah. But in terms of whether we've, we've thought about doing that, we've actually thought about you know, whether we've done that, we haven't, because we just, we're not gonna go do those kinds of things because we're not an insurance company. Yeah. We don't have the right partners. Uh, or we're not, we don't operate in the spaces where, like, like we're talking about trucks and cars, for example. But if we did, we would absolutely do that. Yeah. 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 So, I guess one of the main benefits uh, of taking one of your uh, vehicles, one of the motorbikes, in comparison to taking an Uber, is that probably I'm getting through traffic much faster. Absolutely, you're getting, you're, getting, you're getting everywhere in half the time. Wow. Right, because the, on average, the drivers are moving, um, I think, at like 50 something kilometers per hour, mm -hmm. which is not super fast, right? But think about it, in, in rush hour in Lagos, to go from Lekki phase one, where we are now, to the airport, is a two hour drive, nice. right? But it's a 32 kilometer distance. Wow. Moving at an average of 50 kilometers per hour, I make that same trip on a motorcycle in 35, 40 minutes. Yeah. If I'm moving at 60 kilometers per hour, I'm making that same trip in about 30 minutes. Yeah. If I'm moving at like 80 kilometers per hour, which is super fast, if you, or 90 kilometers per hour, if you ask me, super fast. Right, making that same trip in 20 minutes, yeah. which I mean, it's not practical, right? Yeah. But I think in 20, to, in like 30 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes is a sweet spot, and no matter what the traffic condition is, you're going to get there. Mm -hmm. So, one question I'm, I'm, I'm curious you started as a mass uh, last mile delivery service, correct? And you said you built your own fleet. Do you still own all of your fleet? Is that part of your, is that part of your who you are? Does that define you, or did you? Uh, do you have um, just like Uber, other people that come in with their own vehicles, and you kind of uh, certify them or check if they are up to par, and then you let them roll for you? So that's a fantastic question, right? All the bikes that are active today on our platform, we finance, right? So owning them and financing them are two different things for us, right? Makes sense. So yeah. when we, we finance the vehicles, in that we go and raise the capital for them, mm -hmm. we have partnerships with manufacturers and vendors. Uh -huh. Right, and also for different people within our ecosystem who add value to our business, right? Yeah. And I, so we're able to help, this, to get, to help the drivers get these motorcycles at the best affordable price. Yeah. But we now insist on things like comprehensive insurance, because it's easy for us to do that, because we're already in the space, right? Yeah. We're already on the vehicles. Comprehensive insurance, we provide passenger liability insurance, we provide accident insurance to the drivers, we provide group life, you know, we provide um, um, bereavement benefits, we provide... Um, um, disability benefits to the drivers, wow. right? So it's essentially like a full care package for these drivers. Yeah. Now we do that entire thing, and then the drivers then have to lease the motorcycle to own, and they lease the motorcycle to own over a 10 to 12 month period, sometimes 13 months if need be. Mm -hmm. But drivers typically pay for those motorcycles in 10 to 12 months, mm -hmm. and it's theirs. And then post that, they pay a commission per transaction that okay. we just help them generate on the platform. Wow, makes yeah. sense. So in, in that way, you don't have to own the things and, and you can actually scale without having a uh, need to bring in so much cash for yourself. Exactly. So but what, what we do bring in a lot of cash, yeah. just that it's brought in as debt financing for the drivers. Makes sense, yes, yeah. yes. You, you're a motorbiker yourself? Correct. You said, right? 
how how has this business maybe affected your own personal driving style you know with all oh, this absolutely. information so i wasn't a biker before this business okay i became a biker i started trying to be a biker a month or two into the business uh -huh. <laughs> and then got into an accident that like messed up my like i had like i have a big terrible bruise here and i had like a scar on my face for a bit right scar face you know but um <laughs> I think, so that was 2015, September 18, the accident happened. And then February the next year, or March the next year, I was like, I'm going to get this motorcycle thing right. And I just jumped on the bike and started like going again okay. until I figured it out. Okay. Right. So that's how I became a biker, to be very honest. I mean, I ended up going to like proper, like, I'd gone to a professional driving school for how to drive cars. So I knew pretty much how to drive around the roads and to see. Um, and what I needed to do was to learn how to do the same thing with motorcycles. So. Max has absolutely completely influenced how I ride as a motorcycle driver, right? So, for example, there's a lot of we teach drivers around how do you overtake vehicles, how do you drive around trailers, etc. I take that to heart because we teach these drivers these things because that saves lives, right? I'm trying to live a very long and prosperous life, so I take that to heart and I execute accordingly. Yeah. yeah. Did you did you always know that you want to become an entrepreneur? Yes, I did. I mean, almost is a strong, always is a strong word, right? So I, when I was going out to college in the States in 2007, my plan was I'd go, learn, and then come back to Nigeria to execute. So I went out there, learned, worked for a couple of years, went to grad school, and then came back and started my own business. Truth is, you know, I guess I could have been working somewhere, right? I feel like you will require, I would be required to earn a lot more money to be working somewhere else. But I don't have to be that wealthy to work for myself. So yeah. it's kind of one of, one of those trade-offs because I feel like with this, the work that I do, the work that we all do, is extremely impactful to the rest of the world and also work being a media community. Because part of what we're doing is to be able to tell a different story of Africa, right? So the average motorcycle taxi driver on our platform takes home six to $800 a month. That's a lot of money. That's developer money in this market. Wow. That, right. That's what people earn here? Yes, motorcycle taxes. Here? Yes, I'm oh, wow. taxes on our platform. Wow. Now, the market, in the, the market um, average before we started was $83 a month. Wow. So the same drivers were making about $83, $100, $110 a month are making $600 a month on our platform. Wow. And that's just because of the amount of difference we're able to help them make. So, wow. That's very interesting to hear because that's more than... From all I hear, that someone that graduated from university can earn at a bank or somewhere else. Absolutely, yeah. Wow. It's more. All for safe driving. Yes. But I mean, it's still a lot of work, right? Because yeah. riding, riding, riding is work. Yeah. Especially because the roads are not like smooth. So there's a lot of vibration and it's balancing true. and all that. So there's some exercise for it. But yes, it is, it is worth it, in my opinion. Was Max and G your first business? The first business you started? Um, my first business, serious business, yes. You know, everybody, you kind of have all these side hustles. You know, you buy things on YouTube, put them together and form something. Sorry, on eBay, put them together and sell. I mean, I remember what I did, some things I did in college was, you'd buy like different parts of cameras uh -huh. that people were trying to get rid of. Uh -huh. They wanted to get rid of a camera. But I'm looking at it thinking, oh, you have a Canon DSL, uh, DSLR and you have this part available, you have that part available. And I buy like a bunch of different parts available uh -huh. for like, like pennies on the dollar, right? Uh -huh. Put them together and sell them as a refurbished, camera we okay. had like the tripod and everything built in uh -huh. um so that was that was that was that was um I, that was something i did and i remember like when i when i lived in new york i used to invest in parties i used to give i used to invest in groups that through parties in fact i actually became a party thrower at some point okay because you know, i didn't really like going to parties i like to go to dance so like domolo you know coupe de cali stuff like that <laughs> but at the same time it was um Invested in those kind of events, and I made good money doing it. I think I, I, I made good money doing it, that's what I'll say, right? Uh -huh. um, and then obviously, now Max. So. Do you think that all the, like, you know, the side hustles, as you call them, were like a necessary experience for you to be able to start a, you know, a serious business? Were, were, you know, was I've there never, good learning I've, in it? I've never thought about that. I've never thought about that, so I don't know. If I was, thinking, if I was to say something about that, I'd say, I'd say no, I don't think the side hustles were needed for me to learn. Um, because starting this business, I realized I didn't know Jack. You don't know anything, right? Yeah. Because there's so much learning that still ha happens on the business. 
there's so much you have to learn and at different stages you're learning about different things so today part of what we've been able to do is to build a structure into our business yeah. we didn't have that for a long time and after a while it just felt like oh my god there was always a fire to put out yeah, right yeah. and we had to learn very quickly that look you have a certain structure so that your business can do multiple things at once instead of depending on you your business has to become independent of us as, as entrepreneurs and founders yeah. Yeah. Makes, makes a lot of sense how did you launch? How did you, you know, get your first customer with with uh, your business? So, how did you launch? How did you build your MVP with Max and G back in the days when you were doing the last mile delivery? How did that happen? Okay, cool. So, how did we launch? Um, okay, let's go back to the MVP because that happened first, right? Uh -huh. So we we um, it started as a class project. So my co-founder was in a class, an entrepreneurship, a new business class, an entrepreneurship class, looking at developing markets, so Africa, Southeast Asia, uh -huh. um, Brazil, the brick companies, brick nations, except China, uh -huh. of course. Um, and so you know, they came up with, they were interested in logistics. And I'd been working on, an, on a project at the time, targeting the mother and child. It was e-commerce targeting mothers and children. Okay. And um, realized that I didn't know how to do delivery. So I asked a couple of my friends, and they're like, oh, talk to this dude. We were both at MIT Sloan at the time. Talk to this, 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 this dude. He was at Conga last summer for the internship. He was part of the team that launched Conga's Logistics. And, you know, he's interested in that space. So I reached out, engaged him. We connected, chatted a bit. And I was like, hey, look, I'm working on this class project. Um, I don't know if it's interesting to you, but if it is, like, we'd love to have you on board. I'm like, oh, fantastic. So I got in the class with him, and I'm thinking, oh, this is exciting, right? So I, I help out building our financial models, and then, you know, t time to build out like an MVP tech-wise. I, I get involved, and they're like, oh, you do tech? I'm like, yeah, I work as a software developer in an investment bank, so I know what I'm doing. So I built some more tech from tech with them, you know, had a bunch of people join us initially, and then when it was time to move back to Nigeria, a lot of people left, right? Mm -hmm. Which is fine. So we moved back to Nigeria July 21st. We had letters of interest from a couple of the e-commerce companies that we had, essentially got them to come to working with us. When we landed, though, it was quite different, you know. Having a letter of interest and saying we're well, doing this with you, I do two different things, right? So, <laughs> not those letters of interest essentially just become pieces, became pieces of paper. Um, and for the first week, I think we did only two deliveries or three deliveries the first week. Okay. Um, that was a harsh reality. Okay. Right? Um, and then we just kept at the grind, you know. We'd go out and do marketing drives, sales drives, talk to people, hand out flyers, you know, try to get to use the platform, then we'll to test it out. We didn't have any previous startup experience, which is why I said I wasn't sure if my side hustles helped. Because side, a side hustle, because that's not full-time, is a very different dynamic. Or at least for me, it was a very different dynamic. When this was full-time, when I had to depend on it to make a salary, oh my God, it was a completely, you know, you couldn't be tired, you couldn't be bored, you couldn't be feeling funny, nah, you had to, you were in or you were in, there was no out. <laughs> so it was, it was quite an experience, yeah. But that's how we launched, essentially. It was, it was very crude and very simplistic. Um, would I launch the same way? Absolutely not. I mean, knowing what we know now, we'll be very systematic about launch, you know, yeah. campaigns, you know, have some money budgeted, something we want to spend. We bootstrapped out everything, everything, wow. up until we boosted up for like the first year. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, it was tough. Good start. What, what did your parents and your peers say when you said, okay, you know, I'm moving back and I'm starting this business and I'm going all in, just well, only in? My parents were very, you know, magnanimous. They were very helpful. My dad was like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, it seems kind of crazy. You know? So we're going to suffer out of suffering and hustle and spend all this money in tuition and you're coming back to Nigeria. Really? Bro, you, to, you sure you want to do that? But I mean, he came out, he, but he was also supportful, supportive. Because he, I think he wanted to make sure that I wasn't feeling, I wasn't under some pressure, external pressure to come back to Nigeria for some altruistic thing. Yeah. Uh, my mom was excited, you know, she was happy to see me come back to Nigeria. Oh my God, my son is coming back, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so that was nice. Um, so my parents were supportive. They even gave us some money, right? Okay, wow. Um, a lot of my friends thought I was crazy, right? Especially the ones who, who couldn't see themselves coming back. A lot of my, some of my other friends were like, yeah, you know, that's nice. Oh, that's amazing. They were pumped. They will celebrate you. But I knew that they were like, uh, yeah, I will never do that. But like, good to you, good for you, you know? <laughs> Um, so it was a lot of it was a lot of mixed support here and there. Wow. Yeah. What would be your advice to a young Nigerian today? This country is our country, right? Um, 
we have to rise and you know stand for ourselves and defend ourselves and try to build the future that we want to live in today we have a country that doesn't work right a country that is run by honestly the wrong people um and as young people we need to get to a point where we are making ourselves heard and we're standing up and voting for the people who represent what the future we're trying to build is yeah that's what i'll say well thank you so much for sharing thank you one final question for you yeah do you see the future of your company electric absolutely we just had a head of electric mobility we've raised some capital from and we have an investor called victor energy ventures who's focused on how do you reduce um green gases in the world yeah. i definitely definitely see the future of max as electric absolutely and we're working hard to roll out our first electric vehicles. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you.